But today we got a letter lined in black telling us very coolly from the Colonel. <coughs> Bertha was dead. And I sat and I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed. All day, all morning I cried. But my uncle, he was a kind man. He came up to me and said, My dear, we must go for a walk. You must get some fresh air and dry and be the little boy yourself. And so it was we went for a walk through our country. And we'd come back to the house by that lane that my uncle always means to relay. And there was something, somebody driving carriage, as if the devil was after them, Jen. A coach and four. And as we watched, the carriage pitched over, and it threw its occupants quite on the ground. One was a middle-aged lady who got up and looked embarrassed, and the other was a girl. I think she was my age, her skin as white as moonlight, her hair black and long as a and I talked to her immediately, for I felt a bomb. And she looked at me with hot, intense eyes and said her name was Carmilla. And we were laughing and joking in spite of everything. And I thought, have I found a friend? When I heard her mother say, my dear, my dear, I must carry on, but my, my ward, my child there, she is being badly, badly rattled. Is there a hostelry I can leave her in? Oh, madam, I, I insist that she stay with us. We live just close by here. Uh, she can stay as long as she needs to with us. And I cannot contain my delight of Jen. But she has been allowed to stay. Now the next entry is from a week or so later. And it's written with a slightly different spirit. Oh, journal, I write turn to you again. Because I am so confused. No, none of your source. I have not quarrelled with Carmen. Quite the opposite. Come here. I haven't quarrelled with her. Quite the opposite. We are closer than ever. I could not have wanted for a better friend. We run by moonlight. We laugh at the wind. She tells me tales. Tales of her people. She is one of the Braganza from Baden. They came over, she said, with the Spanish in the Great Wars. And she stayed. And the people stayed. And ruled the lands. And when she describes it, it is as if she is there. It is so palpable, so powerful. But she is strange. I never see her before five o'clock, ever. She gets up and the sun begins to whisper. I quite loved her. Oh, and she won't eat for the rest of the family. But once you've got over that, she is my ideal, ideal friend. No, it's not that. It's that there is some part of me, I think, that cannot bear ever to be parted from her. You see, the last two nights, I have had the darkest of dreams. Two nights ago, I woke up, it seemed to me in this dream, and I was lying on my bed, and there was a great cat in the room. A cat that looked like it was lit by moonlight, but there is no moon. And as I looked, it watched me with hot, intense eyes. Yeah, they opened. But just then, in my dream, there was a voice, a voice I seemed to know, my mother's voice, which I have not heard in 10 years or more. My child, my child, have care, have caution, my child, my child. And it seemed to me the cat heard it, for it ran out of the window and was gone. And I woke up. And I was standing by the window, which was open. But there was no cat. Only Carmilla's door window, which was open as well. And 
was two nights ago. And then I am almost ashamed to say it. Last night I had a In that dream, I woke up. And it was much later, I thought. But only my eyes seemed awake. The rest of me could not move. But my eyes saw something there in the corner of my room. A face lit by moonlight, although there was no moon. For when I had gone to bed, there was cloud and storm. A face I knew so well, it was mine. And as I watched, she started to come towards me, gloating. As I've always thought, spirits must be. Coming then to the very side of my bed, kneeling down, and her head rested on my stomach, and I could say nothing. And she stared at me with hot, intense eyes. And then her teeth <coughs> shone red. And I fell. In my dream, I fell into a swoon. And I knew nothing, nothing at all, journal, until nearly mid-morning, when the servants were knocking at the door, and they woke me up. <laughs> my bedroom was disheveled. I had slept badly. And I had spent most of the night, it seemed on the very edge of my bed, so that its metal frame had caught me. A wound, just above the stomach, all bruised and bloody. <laughs> A wound I cannot <coughs> tell you, save you. I cannot tell Carmilla. It would sound by the dream I blamed her. I cannot tell my uncle. Only you. Now the next. It's quite different. It is a note from a letter, I think from the uncle. It's been pasted in a lot later by the look of the pages. It recounts of a trip. Well, I'll let the uncle go. Oh, I thought we needed to get away from the house and uh, see some new scenes. So I took the girls to the nearby town and we went round the museum. I seen the chief portraits in which I was most interested, I left the girls to their own devices in the gallery and I retired opposite the road to a, a rather fine hostelry I know. But no sooner had I sat down with my brother. Uncle! Uncle! Come! Come! Come quick! I have something to show you! Come! My ward burst in, most insistent that I follow her back to the gallery, which I did. Look! Braganza family. It's got a date. 1680. Right to draw my attention. Look! It's her. Because the figure at the back was the absolute spitting image. It is her. her. It's most remarkable, my And look next door. Next to her. Yes, I only saw her the once, but it does indeed look like her mother. Good. Mm -hmm. They must be her relatives. But so like. You would imagine they absolutely must be. How extraordinary. But when we asked no, nothing, just my guess is so. We left it at that. What else could we do? But it was a most remarkable coincidence. The next is a journal entry. And the writing is really beginning to change now. It's becoming erratic, desperate. But the words are classified. At least the beginning. Journal, I write on you again, for I must steady my thoughts. No, I will have none of your sauce. I have not argued with Carmilla. Quite the contrary. I find that I can only be alive when she is around. So much so that I have quite adopted her body pattern. I wake up when she does at five. I seldom see the sun. I used to love it so very, very much. And when she's not around, And I long for that clip 
Ano to? Hello, my name is now trouble. I see I am in the cat. Welcome in. This is you. But even my uncle has started to notice. He talks, taking me to the doctor. Now the next entry is a strange one. It is again a letter from the uncle to somebody, but short, and over which is pasted a note from the doctor. A doctor, a well renowned man. I said to him, My good sir, I cannot, I cannot believe what has happened to my niece. She is so listless, she, she hardly eats, and most distressed and disturbed. I would have your advice now you receive her. Today I saw what one seldom sees. Often it is true that a 14, 15 year old girl will get some sort of wild fancy. I've often seen that. But this, the fancy had become more than that. You read about it in the medical books. Vampirism, they call it. It seems to sap the spirits. It drains the nature. So that when I tried her pulse, it was erratic. Well, I prescribed what you always prescribe, brandy and ether. But I was not sure, as a man of reason, how they would work. And so it was. I took the uncle aside and said, Sir, yes. may I speak to you, not as a doctor, but as a man of the world? Oh, please do, indeed. Have you walked off unhealthy obsessions? Oh, undoubtedly <coughs> there is a, a girl staying with us called Carmilla. She well, I want out. to know no details. But if you would have my advice, separate them now. Take her on a trip, on a holiday. Drive off the barn, it's not too far. It's lovely this time of year. And do it right away. She needs a break. I know what. Her malady is not one my drugs can touch. Why don't you take her to the monks in Baden? Get them here a confession. That will appeal to her fanciful mind. I shall. Thank you. And so the note ended. Now the next entry is wild, irresolute. It is the ward writing in her journal. What a day! How can I say what happened today? Well, I shall try. I went to the doctor. Uh, uh, my uncle had insisted. And when I came out, and he came back from his little chat, he suddenly said, My dear, we are going away at once to Bath. Should we go back and get Camilla? No, no, we will send back the carriage for anything we need, and Camilla as well. They can join us later. We must go. <coughs> and so it was, he swept me off into the carriage, and we drove off into the mountains. Now, it was true. When we got about five miles, Everyone felt like my old self. Oh, I was tired and I was old. But the sunlight felt like a night. And we journeyed. It was a long journey to Baden. And we arrived, and it was late afternoon, early evening. And my uncle, who knows all the best places, said, oh, and to this hostelry, uh, this is a good one. And he took me into a hostelry. He thought well. And we had not been in there long when suddenly he looked to the back and he said, Good Lord, is it? It is, old oh, fellow. Oh. It was the Colonel. Delighted to meet you. What brings you here? And then he looked at me with strange eyes and he said, Are you well? But before I could reply, he said, I think I will tell you what happened to my Bertha. I know I said she was killed, but that is only half the truth, because she was murdered. Good God. 
murdered by a girl, and we had taken into our house, under a strange custody. The mother had left them due to an accident in the lane. A girl who called herself Cassandra, who seemed to suck the very life, the very spirit out of my ward, so that in the end, her heart gave up. And that night she died, Cassandra disappeared. I'm sure she lay at the foot. Now is this story yours? Tell me the truth. It is indeed, except but, she calls herself Carmilla. But before I could reply, a coach arose, driving along, a coach I knew so well, for it was ours, and by my quickening heart, she got out of the coach, and the colonel saw her, and bellowed with fury, and he got out a gun that he must have carried around with him, and he shot her, full in the face. <coughs> but the bullet never hit her, and they never saw the body, and they looked around for it, but they could not see, because they had not seen. But at the moment the gun was fired, Camilla had looked at me. Climbs of him to the eyes. And as I looked down into my shadow, I saw that it had changed. It had become something firm. Well, the colonel said, Not sure what happened, but she will be back to claim you. And we will sit guard. And they had me sit down on an easy chair. And, he, and the colonel sat on one side and my uncle upon the other. But before they told me to go to sleep, the colonel put upon my finger a ring, <coughs> about which was set a christening bell. He said, after it happened, I, I went to a wise woman, and she said, if only my, my Bertha had worn this charm. Blessed in olden days, she would have been saved. So you wear it. And then he sat guard over me, lowering. Well, the night wore on. And I soon realised by their breathing, they were asleep. And I looked down, and there she was, looking back at me. My Carmilla. But I could not say anything. It was like my base nature was keeping my better quite silent. But just as she came towards me, her eyes flashing red, <coughs> my hand, on which was the bell, moved. The bell rang true, a silver peal across the land. And my uncle and the colonel woke right up. It's her! Oh. And they got out their guns in which they had laid with loaded silver bullets and oh. fired! Oh. But Camilla had already disappeared out of the window. Oh. And I knew she was gone indeed. Then the colonel said, We must find her. That's but crazy. I have not long to the tombs of the Braganza. I cannot find them. But there will be records in the monastery, but you know my Latin isn't very good. Oh, well, let us go there, and I will look through them and see what I can find. Now, if truth be said, my uncle had many talents. He was a fine scholar. So, it was, when he poured over all the books, he knew what he was reading. But even then, even, even then it took him to the evening, before finally he said, I think this is it. I think I found where Carmilla's family is. It is a map? Yes. Of the catacombs. Oh, very. And they loaded silver bullets in their guns. And they got what monks would follow them, who came down with hot, burning oils. And drugs. And they said, you must come. For we will follow also your fear. And we went then into the catacombs. Left, right, right, left.
and just a veritable worm under the bun. But always, I knew they were on the right track. But my heart grew tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. Until at last, the colonel said, look! Ganza. And we came to a great tomb. And they went inside. But they looked at all the graves. And all the graves were plundered. And the bodies strewn on the ground. And they could not see what I could see. But my eyes froze on to the grave hidden in the corner. Ah. But the colonel and my uncle. There's a grave. And my, uh, my uncle got out a little crowbar that he carried with him, and he forced open the grave. There she was, shining bright, intense, my Carmilla. And as I watched, she jumped upon the colonel, forcing his head quite back. And he held her down, man as he was, as she wrenched. But my uncle, by now, had got his pistol ready. And he came behind Carmilla and fired a bullet full into her back of her head. And point blank range he fired. And then the monks, they threw on holy oil. They blessed her with holy hosts. They sung the requiem. And as the requiem was sung, there was a sigh across the land. And I felt it was like a mother. Well, 